The tropics are the part of the world that remains warm all year long. The forests of the tropics, called tropical forests, are dark and humid. They circle the globe in a ring around the equator 23 and a half north and south and are classified by the greatest diversity of species. Tropical rainforest is the best known type of tropical forest and it flourishes in places that are warm as well as rainy throughout the year. These forests are found along the equator where days and night are equal. Flow of air comes from the poles towards the equator. These winds are filled with moisture and the intense heat at the equator causes the moisture to rise, cool and then condense to create rain. It becomes a continuous cycle. As a result, it rains here almost 24 hours a day. It is an ideal weather for plants, which not only allows them to keep their leaves, but also gives an opportunity to continuously grow. In addition to these large varieties of plants, it also inhabits so many animal species that no one has ever tried to keep a record of them. Tropical rainforests occupy a large area in Northern South America, Central Africa and Southeast Asia. Rainy mountains, islands and coasts throughout the tropics have patches of rainforest spread over their landscape. Other than the tropical rainforest, there are these seasonal tropical forests that have one or more wet seasons followed by a long period when it hardly rains. Even though few tree species are found here, the wildlife still is very rich. The reason why such a vast area of wildlife and plant species have evolved here is tropical forests have existed for more than 100 million years. The species living in these forests rely on each other in complex ways making these forests fragile places. Ever since people started cutting down the trees, the face of tropical forests have started to change. New species have been introduced by humans. As a result, many of the original inhabitants of tropical forests are disappearing. Spread across a large landscape, this is the tropical forest of Central America. Large areas of these forests have been felled to create land for farming. Yet, there are pockets of forests protected in the mountains and in the humid lowlands of the east. Southern Asia is the biggest area of seasonal tropical forest. The forest there is called monsoon forest because of an unusually intense rainy season called the monsoon. The monsoon is caused by wind blowing in one direction during summer and in opposite direction during winter. The wind is caused by a difference in the way earth's land and sea warm up during the year. As the summer sun shines, the land warms up and cools down as quickly in winter. During summer season, the vast landmass of Asia warms up enormously because of its size which results in air rising over it. Moist air or the monsoon wind from the ocean rushes inland to replace the rising air. As the monsoon wind crosses the land, it dumps its moisture as heavy rain. In India, it can rain every day for weeks during the monsoon. During winter, the landmass of Asia starts to cool and the air above it starts to sink and spreads outwards, causing a dry wind to blow south from Asia towards the Indian Ocean. In dry season, months can pass without rain. Temperature and humidity keep varying from place to place inside a tropical forest. For example, the treetops are sunnier and warmer than the forest floor. These different conditions found in various parts of the forest has been termed as microclimates by scientists. Other than the temperature and humidity, light levels, wind speeds and the quantity of oxygen and carbon dioxide also vary from place to place in the forest. A large range of microhabitats are a part of these microclimates. This is one of the reasons why there are so many species found in tropical forests. It is interesting to know that tropical forests do not have summers and winters. But the change in conditions from day to night 
is similar to that of the two seasons. The day is like the summer season, warm and bright. This helps the plants to grow fastest, just as they would grow in the summer season. As night falls, the forest becomes cooler and darker. Most of the plants are not able to grow and the condition is similar to winter. There is a vast difference between the temperatures at night and during the day and it is larger than the difference between the average temperatures in January and July. Weather in the lowlands is different from weather on the mountains. The lowlands in tropic region are often hot and humid and have very little breeze blowing. In contrast, mountains are usually cooler and windier and make the air feel fresh. On a single mountain, the weather can be totally opposite to each other. One side of the mountain can be wet and rainy, while the other can be as dry as a desert. Even when the weather below is dry and clear, some tropical mountains always seem to be masked in mist. Strange and enchanting forests grow in these places. The plants here thrive the moisture-laden air. These forests are called the cloud forests. Cloud forests can be as lush and green as the lowland forests except for the plants that are different here. The trees that grow here are often shorter and crooked. These are small plants called the epiphytes. These plants hang from the tree's branches and cling to their trunk. The epiphytes grow so thick that the whole cloud forest appears as if it is dripping with plant life. This is Amazon rainforest. It is as large as all of USA from the Rockies to the Atlantic Ocean. It occupies a vast flat river basin that is filled with branches of the mighty and Earth's largest river, the Amazon River. The mighty rivers of the Amazon basin flood an area of forest the size of England every rainy season. The Amazon rainforest appears endless and is inaccessible so it remains unexplored. Early explorers described it as an area where water had swapped places with land. One can move along the wide smooth rivers but the dense forest is almost impassable. Sloths can be seen hanging from the branches of trees in the Amazon. The movements of these sloths are so slow that algae or simple plants grow in their fur. This gives the sloths a green tinge. They rarely venture on the ground and even give birth on trees. They survive by eating leaves and twigs that are low in nutrients so they conserve energy by moving very slowly. The sloths can spend most of their time hanging motionless as they digest their food. The hawk-like claws of these sloths is so effective that they may stay hanging for weeks even after they have died. Most plants grow well when they have plenty of sunlight, lots of water and a warm climate. Tropical forests provide this ideal condition all year around, allowing a staggering number of plants to grow here. These plants of the tropical forests have to face a tough life, even though the tropical climate is ideal for plants to grow. Plants here not only grow from the soil, they also grow on trees. A few tiny plants can be seen growing on plants that themselves are growing on trees. This is the epiphytes plant which grows on other plants and gets all the moisture from the air or rain. This overcrowding of forest plants makes the life tough for them and they are in constant battle with each other to survive. Receiving ample amount of sunlight is one of the major concerns of the plants for their survival. These plants have to live in the shadows of huge trees that are rightly called the kings of the forest. Rainforest trees are considered to be among the tallest plants in the world. These trees typically have tall trunks with very few low branches. A large number of branches are found on the top of the tree which spread out to form a broad crown over the tree. All the crowns together form a thick layer of leaves and are called the canopy. This canopy soaks up the sun's rays, allowing little or no sunlight to reach the floor. These giant trees are called the emergence and are taller than the canopy and poke out of the top. The roots of these emergence are huge 
and spreading out from the base of the trunk and supporting the tree's weight. The world underneath the canopy is darker. In spite of this, many plants manage to survive in this shady world. Ferns can make do with the greenish light filtering through the canopy, while other plants cheat for their survival by hitching a ride on other plants. These plants that grow on other plants are known as epiphytes. They grow by sprouting and taking roots in the nooks of the trunks and branches of trees. This way, they come much closer to the sunlight than the plants that grow on the ground. The plants that do not sprout in the canopy climb to get to the sunlight. The roots of these epiphytes stick to the bark of the tree and the plant grows steadily towards the sunlight. As the ends of the roots die, the whole plant creeps gradually up the tree. The movement of these plants can be compared to that of a slow-moving snail. This is another climber plant called the lianas. It starts from the ground and then leans on the tree for support. They do not have a need to produce trunk of their own and their wire-like stems quickly shoot up and reach the canopy. Once they reach the canopy, they grow a crown that can be as big as the tree supporting them. This crown puts the supporting tree into shade and in due course of time, weakens it. In tropical rainforests, lianas have the capability to grow hundreds of meters. As they move up dangling the tree, they tie lots of trees together. Lianas can be found in open areas like the riverbanks. Lianas are also used as a source of water by people. People often chop them open and bring the clear water that dribbles out. These are strangler figs, another form of climbing plants. As the name suggests, these figs strangles and kills the tree they grow on. These strangler figs begin their life as epiphytes. They grow out from seeds left high in the branches by an animal. As the strangler's leaves start climbing upwards towards the light, its roots start growing and moving downwards towards the ground, wrapping around the tree's trunk. As the strangler gets bigger, more roots twist around the trunk and soon the trunk of the tree is surrounded by a lattice of roots and it appears as if the roots are strangling the tree within. Up above, the strangler's crown grows so big that it casts a huge shadow over the tree. As a result, the tree is deprived of sunlight and ultimately dies. The trunk of the dead tree rots, but the strangler keeps standing. The network of roots of the strangler forms a hollow trunk which is strong enough to hold the mature crown above. Plants usually have to face a challenge of getting water. But when it comes to rainforest, the challenge can be opposite. Here, the trees have to cope up with frequent rains. The downpour allows too much water to collect on the leaves. As a result, it weighs down the branches. This is the reason many rainforest trees have smooth leaves that repel water and pointed leaf tips that help the water to dribble off. Even though the rainforest trees are huge, their roots are shallow. This makes them prone to fall over during storms so that some of the trees have stilt-like roots that help them prop up. In spite of being shallow, the roots of a rainforest trees spread widely from the base of the tree. As we have seen, epiphytes do not start their life on the ground, so it is important for them to get water from somewhere else. Many epiphytes have roots that collect water from the rain dribbling down the trees, while many can absorb water from the humid air. Most of the epiphytes have thick leathery leaves or swollen stems to store water. Some epiphytes are also parasites. They live by stealing food and water from another plant. These parasites drive their roots deep into the host tree and tap into the veins for food. While there are some parasites that have their own leaves for making food, but other than light and water, plants also need chemicals called the nutrients for their survival. They get these nutrients from the rotting animals and plant remains from the soil. The tropical forest soil is formed from the animal droppings, dead leaves, fragment of woods and dead animals. 
the insects, fungi and bacteria, break this mixture down and turn it into a damp compost. In the process, the nutrients are released. As the tropical forests are often more warm and wet, the rotting matter is broken down very quickly. The nutrients released are absorbed by the trees almost as soon as they are released. This results in the soil of tropical forests being shallow and low in nutrients. It is important to note that if rotting matter was not replacing the consumed nutrients at a regular interval, then the soil would soon run out of nutrients and then nothing would grow in tropical forests. Epiphytes have to manage to get the nutrients from high in the trees. Some collect falling bits of debris which slowly build up to a thin layer of soil. The epiphytes that steal water from their host get a constant supply of nutrients dissolved in water for free. With so many plants growing in the tropical forest, it is but obvious to assume that rainforest is living banquet full of tasty leaves for plant-eating animals. But this is not the case. Many of the leaves contain deadly poison or foul-tasting chemicals that stop animals from eating these leaves. The only animal who tackles this problem is the leaf-eating monkey. But it is not an easy task. What the monkeys do is they choose only the youngest, most tender leaves. They eat these leaves from lots of different tree species. They vary their diet in order to prevent any single poison from building up too much inside them. The beautiful flowers that grow on the plants and trees are not just for decoration purpose. Their main purpose is to enable plants to reproduce through a process of pollination. The process of pollination is not as simple as it sounds because unlike animals, the plants cannot move from one place to another to find a mate. But they have other ways to ensure that their male and female cells come together. The most popular way to ensure this is to make pollen. Pollen is dust like substance that carries the male cells from one flower to another. When this pollen lands on the female part of a flower, it sprouts and grows down into the flower to deliver the male cell. For these plants, finding a partner for pollination is tricky in tropical forests. The reason is the presence of so many different species. The challenge is a plant can reproduce only with other members of its own species. But the nearest mate may have grown miles away. So how does the pollen reach their mate? As far as tall trees are concerned, the wind carries their pollen. The tree flowers release a large quantity of tiny pollen grains into the air. Most blow away and get lost, but there are few grains that settle on exactly the right flowers far away in the forest. But this kind of pollination can only occur above the canopy. Below the canopy, the air is too still for wind pollination. So the plants have to depend on flying animals to carry the pollen between flowers. But this service carried out by them is not free. In return, these flying animals get nectar, which is a sugary liquid produced by flowers. There are a few animals that eat some of the pollen. The most common animal pollinators are flying insects like bees, butterflies, beetles and moths. Flowers have different shapes in order to suit their pollinator. These flowers are broad and dish-shaped and are pollinated by beetles. These bright colored flowers are the bee flowers. They open up during the day when bees are busiest. These bright colored flowers have lines that direct the bee towards the pollen. Butterfly flowers are usually funnel shaped. To reach the nectar at the base of the funnel, butterfly uses a very long part of its mouth that works like a straw. 
when the butterfly is not feeding, this straw-like mouth part coils up under its head. Moths feed just like butterflies, only a difference being instead of day, moths feed during night. Their flowers are usually white in color and are scented so that the moths can easily find them in the dark. Even birds and bats help in the process of pollination. It is interesting to see hummingbird hovering beside their flowers. They flap their wings up to 70 times a second to keep themselves perfectly still as they probe for nectars with their bills. As bats feed during night, their flowers are often pale with musty scent. Most of the bat flowers have a shape like brushes. When a bat visits the flower, the brush gives its chest a dusting of pollen. Many birds and bats are too big to fly into the middle of a plant. As a result, their flowers are located on the outside of the plant. An example of this kind of flower is the banana flower that is pollinated by bats. This is the world's biggest flower belonging to a peculiar plant called Rafflesia arnoldi. This plant grows only in the rainforests of Sumatra. Rafflesia is more like a fungus than a plant. It has no true roots, stem or leaves. As a result, it cannot make its own food. So it lives as a parasite and sends fine thread-like growths into vines to steal water and nutrients. The only part of this peculiar plant that can be seen is the gigantic red and white flower that grows up to three feet wide on the forest floor. Just like the plant, the flower is also weird and smells of rotting flesh, attracting flies that normally lay eggs on dead animals. These flies are tricked by the foul stench of the flower and without knowing, pollinate the flower. After the seeds are formed, the main challenge the plants face is spreading their seeds. The seeds cannot be just dropped onto the ground. If this happens, then the young plants would end up crowding each other and competing with themselves and the parent plant for sunlight, nutrients and water. To avoid this challenge, most plants have devised ways of dispersing their seeds. Through these ways, even though many seeds go waste in the crowded forest, a few stand a good chance of finding just the right place to start life. One of the interesting ways found by the tallest trees is to produce seeds with wings. This makes the seeds spin around in the air and slows their fall. These seeds, released from high treetops, can travel a long way on the breeze. Other tropical forest plants have a different strategy to spread their seeds. They bribe the animals to carry the seeds away. This is done by enclosing the seed in an edible fruit. Animals eat these fruits, swallowing the seeds and then move away into the forest. When the seeds pass out of the animal's body in the form of droppings, they are far away from the parent plant. These seeds land on the ground in a heap of droppings. That is a perfect fertilizer for the young plants. Durians are large, spiky fruits that look like giant horse chestnuts. The flesh inside the durian fruit is sweet, but the fruit itself has such a disgusting, rotten smell that it is banned from many restaurants in Southeast Asia where durian trees grow. But in forest, the powerful smell attracts orangutans, tigers and many other animals. These animals eagerly devour the custard-like flesh. The seeds produced by plants enable them to spread to new places. While there are some tropical trees that can spread from where they stand, they can do this by growing sideways. A typical example of such tree is the banyan tree. It is a native of tropical Asia. The banyan tree produces aerial roots that grow down from its branches and on reaching the ground, they become new trunks. A single banyan tree has the capacity to spread indefinitely this way and can turn into a thicket or even a small forest. 
Once a seed has taken root and sprouted into a sapling or a baby tree, it faces a new challenge of lack of light. The floor of a tropical forest is dark and gloomy, making it almost impossible for the saplings to receive sunlight for their growth. Many trees have developed a solution for this challenge. What they do is after growing a few meters tall, they top their growth. They can wait for years like this by absorbing just enough energy from the dim light to keep themselves alive. Their big chance comes when a big tree falls down and creates a gap in the canopy. This gap allows the sunlight to flood the forest floor. Once the gap is created, the saplings race upwards in a fierce contest to fill the empty space. But not all plants win in the competition. Only one is able to make it to the top and the gap disappears. There are some small plants that grow only in gaps. They flower and set seeds quickly before the forest closes in again. The seeds then lie ready in the soil for the next gap to form. Lying in a vast river basin straddling the equator in Central Africa, this is the Congo rainforest. The heart of the forest comprises of unspoiled wilderness. Rivers and occasional clearings break the canopy. The swampy clearings or the bias of the Congo region are no less than magnets to the wildlife, attracting forest elephants and lowland gorillas. These animals visit the place to eat roots, grass and minerals. These swampy clearings allow scientists to study the animals before they melt back into the forest. Most of Africa's rainforest is in or around the Congo Basin. But some parts of West Africa too is home to rainforest. The central part of the Congo rainforest is so swampy and difficult to reach that it remains almost untouched by loggers and farmers. Yet, deforestation by farmers and loggers is a growing problem in outer parts of the Congo Basin. One of the most interesting animals to inhabit the Congo rainforest is the bonobo or pygmy chimpanzee. These chimpanzees live only in the south of the Congo River. Even though it is called pygmy chimpanzee, it is no smaller than its cousin, the common chimpanzee. Scientists are of the opinion that bonobos are descended from a group of chimpanzees that crossed the Congo River from north to south some 1.5 million years ago. They were isolated by the river and its swamps and thus evolved separately. It has been found that common chimpanzees live in aggressive and male-dominated societies. The males form gangs and sometimes wage war on rival groups. In contrast to them, the bonobos live in more peaceful, female-dominated societies. Other than the bonobos, the tropical forests are abounding with an amazing number of weird and wonderful animals. As we shall see in the next part, the tropical forests are also home to the most colorful animals on planet Earth. <laughs>